Hello, everyone. I'm really happy to see you all here in our panel, in our discussion panel. And I think it will be great to start with the introductions. Who we have with us today? It's, of course, Emmanuel Daniel. He's the founder of the Asian Banker, Wealth and Society, and BankQuality.com. He continues to serve as an advisor and consultant to various governments and institutions, and is a highly regarded confidant in leadership circles. He is an esteemed global speaker on a variety of topics in the financial services industry and the development of the future of Asia. His first book on the future of finance will be published in the end of this year. We have Anna Chubinidze with us. She's a social scientist building the bridge with computer science, artificial intelligence with various organizations. She has been working on AI projects, including governance, ethics, regulations, industry standards, and even ghostwriting strategy. She is a speaker at multiple events globally, and now she is the CEO of Adelan AI in Berlin, which focuses on AI governance, policy, and ethics consulting. She has advised organizations how to identify and address AI regulatory and ethical risks affecting the business and investment decisions in the EU and internationally. We have Emmanuel Goffi. He is AI philosopher, which is very interesting, and consulted on ethical particularism and artificial intelligence. Based on this, he's co-director and co-founder of Global AI Ethics Institute, which aims at opening the debate on AI ethics to all philosophical stances, wisdom, and perspectives coming from different cultures on our planet. And also, he is applying this philosophy on practice, uh, consulting Huawei on AI ethics and bring, making the bridge between different cultures from the business perspective. We have Aishwarya Srinivasan. She is AI and ML innovation leader at IBM Data and AI. She is an advocate for open source technologies and currently a developer advocate for PyTorch Lightning and previously a contributor to the Scikit-Learn. I think most of you know Scikit-Learn. She is ambassador to the Women Data Science community originating from Stanford University. She actively organizes events and conferences to inspire budding data scientists. She has been spotlighted as a LinkedIn Top Voice 2020 for Data Science and AI, which features top 10 ML influencers across the world. And of course, Steve Norris. Steve is head of data science and AI at the Australian Computer Society, who has evolved the way people look at AI and innovations. With more than 300 million views on social media in the last year, he aims to inspire people through the latest technology trends and empower prospective data scientists through high quality educational content. He is an AI expert in the International Standards Organization, a member at the Forbes Tech Council, uh, to Australian ICT Professional of the Year and accomplished influence on LinkedIn. And myself, Alex Concher, I'm co-founder and machine learning director at Neurons Lab, machine learning consulting company. And today I'll be humbly listening to all the experts who are with me here. A small outline what you want to discuss today. Uh, from my a bit maybe a practical bias, I want to bring us starting from the really high level strategy, philosophical and ethical questions, and going a bit down, a bit on the details, how it actually works, but not from the technical side, but from the management side. How do we actually implement it? How do we control it? And how do we ensure that the philosophical wealth and educational activities that we start and develop actually go in the right direction? And uh, starting with the philosophy, uh, there is this uh, thought that the philosophy of AI is kind of outdated because we're kind of just looking on the biases and patterns from the past instead of actually trying to develop something like a new intelligence, new artificial intelligence. And uh, what we're actually doing, are we doing just uh, ethics, basically trying to look what humans did in the past? Or are we just using these words? Does AI exist? And uh, Emmanuel Goffi, you as the philosopher, you can you can start opening this topic. Uh, that, that, that's a really tough subject. Obviously, there is no truth about uh, AI and, and, and its potential reality. But um, what I can say from the philosophical stance is that there is a lack of philosophical reflection. Lots of people are doing ethics without doing ethics. And that's really problematic when it comes to artificial intelligence, because doing so, we are avoiding really deep and complex questions. Uh, the, the difficulty that we all have, I think, is to uh, bridge the needs of philosophy with the, need, the needs of, of uh, operational managers, right? Because time is not the same. So uh, on one side, you need to go really fast and you don't have that much time to spend into philosophical questions. On the other side, my side, uh, I think that we must take much more time. We, we do 
have, we do need actually to go deeper into philosophy and to think about ethics, not just as a communication tool, but as a process to think about AI, its risks, its benefits. Anyone else want to comment on this? Do you guys agree or don't agree with this? Maybe we are all, all on set with AI actually. I think maybe I can comment. Um, yeah, just uh, just about I'll share just about the opinion um, that I, I have agreed so far. Um, I, I've heard from many scientists that uh, or, uh, are already stating that the philosophy has emerged due to AI. AI has helped or supported to reemergence of the philosophy and philosophical ideas because it's the age which is kind of a transition from one point of humanity to, to the other because of its disruptive character of such a technology that AI is. And then it's like our um, our questions that we were question existential questions that we had so far, uh, it is re-emerging now again and we try to explore. Um, the existential questions when it comes to technologies and transhumanism and so on. So not only philosophy reduced in, in the interest, but actually it was um, it was more encouraged and re-emerged in AI age. Emmanuel, you say that the, the thing is that today people who are not ethicists, they're working on the ethics. And uh, what is and what kind of problem it brings? Why? For example, uh, the engineering approach or entrepreneurship approach might uh, lead us in the wrong direction from the ethics point of view. The, the point is that uh, uh, doing the ethics without having any kind of philosophical background uh, is not really doing ethics, right? It's a, it, ethics is a really complex field of study, so you need some, uh, some background, you need some knowledge, you need some skills in order to do that. What I've seen so far is that lots of people are just providing bullet points, solutions to really complex problems. And where I do not agree with Anna is that I don't feel like we are, uh, philosophy is re-emerging. It's a really superficial uh, layer of philosophy that is re-emerging, but we are not going deep into the questions that are raised by artificial intelligence. For example, I haven't seen anything about, and you were mentioning that, Alex, at the very beginning, is AI something that really exists, or is it only kind of a narrative, a speech hack, actually, because we don't know what artificial means exactly, we don't know what intelligence means, so I don't know how we can pretend that artificial intelligence exists. This is the kind of question that we can have. And regarding, for example, biases, also we are all discussing about biases as we are rediscovering that human beings are made of biases. Our whole life is made of, of biases. So when we're trying to just remove biases from artificial intelligence, we are not trying to mimic or duplicate brain or uh, human intelligence it, if, if it ever exists. We are trying to do something that is kind of idealistic in the sense that we're trying to do something that would be perfect in the sense that there would be no flaws in, in, this, uh, in this system. So these are the kind of questions that we are not asking because once again, we have to go fast because companies need to go fast, obviously. Uh, and, and sometimes we are just uh, you know, uh, putting aside the very complex questions that do take time. And at the very end, what will happen is that we are doing what I call cosmetics. We're just hiding uh, the reality behind the view of ethics. We're just summoning the vocabulary of ethics with, without doing that uh, really well. But I feel like on the long run, it will pose a lot of problems because we are not asking the fundamental question about what kind of society do we want for the future? And when I say what kind of society, I mean, we should ask that for each and uh, yes, and each and every society, not only the Western society. Where do we wanna go? We don't know that, we don't ask that. We're just assuming that AI is here and we have to deal with that. And then we have to find solutions to existing problem. And, this is something that is really problematic because we are we will not find any kind of, of good solution with that. I know, and here is basically where I started uh, to say, I said that I have a bias and I want to ask Steve and Anna because my bias is the action and to the processes and to the metrics. I know that Steve is working on the ISO standards and regulations for the AI. I know that Anna is consulting companies on this. When you work as regulations, when you work as companies, you kind of, you require, you require a plan, you require metrics and some actions. And guys, how would you comment on this? Basically, how do you merge the philosophical ideas and some actionable plan which you can actually measure and improve? Um, so I can go first. I do agree in, um, in most of the parts with Emmanuel. Um, it, it is a very complex question and very complex uh, problem that we are having because um, humans are biased. 
And, and we all know that um, not all the bias are bad. Like we do have certain characteristics that are uh, protected and uh, we should make sure that AI is not biased against them. And also we need to understand what do we uh, think about the fairness? What do we think about all the pillars of the ethics that we're uh, discussing as a framework? In the um, ISO and other, all the standards organizations, they're essentially thinking about um, how they can come up with best practices and um, ideas that can become a roadmap for societies, for governments, for um, um, legal organizations to make ensure and enforce some of these standards um, that are very important and crucial. But at the end of the day, if you want to have a definitive solution for this, I'm, I'm going to um, um, say, unfortunately, we don't have it yet. Um, we are walking through the process. There are lots of great advances um, in terms of explainability of the AI, understanding all the characteristics of um, you know, uh, decision-making, um, and this would help, but uh, this is an open discussion that we are having. In, that's why the organizations exist. They, they want to bring experts together and they would think about the problems that are um, right now um, open discussions in the society. Anna, yeah, maybe. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, I do agree with Steve uh, that it is it is very complex question. And also um, referring back again to Imano's comments. Um, so basically, the reemergence of philosophy was um, in terms in terms of reemergence the questions and questioning of existential rather than searching for the answers. Uh, so basically, it's like. In, in a very fast paced world and in a very fast paced technological development that, that is happening today, it is very hard to uh, catch up with finding the answers. It is true for regulations. Uh, it is, it ha it's happening relatively very slow. It is true for the standardization. It is also happening very slow, but the very first thing that is happening is actually the technological development. So uh, there is exactly this huge gap. And also the as for, as for the matrix, um, I think, that's very, very complex question. It's very hard to answer in two, three minutes. But uh, basically, there will be some, some realm, some parts where we will need to have some metrics, some specific yes or no questions, some specific measures, uh, where uh, we will need to have specific answers to very specific ethical questions because the technology itself requires such solutions. Like I, I, I very much like to bring this uh, example. I'm not a tech person, not a big computer science background, but uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, so in a reinforcement learning, at least you need to always have, when you're teaching, right, you, you need to always have some specific specific measures for what you punish system or for what you reward system. So in that case, you need to have uh, yes or no questions. You need to have some um, measures to, to teach and input into machine, right? Um, this will be where we would need a metrics, for example. But if we want the machines to be really autonomous, to be really like us, then we also need to have fine technological solutions, how, how we put them, that what we have inside us, um, whatever it is, is computer brain, is it computer brain, is it soul, is it mind, whatever we call it, is it consciousness? So if we do not put that into a machine, then we will, we will need to have very specific metrics, very specific answers, whatever we are teaching and we are inputting into machine. So it all depends. We either need very specific metrics, very specific questions to teach and input to the machine, or we need to develop such a technology that has our, whatever we have as a consciousness or uh, whatever we call like mind or um, a soul. Ashwari, Manuel, Daniel, what do you think about this? Just someone. Ashwarya, maybe you. <laughs> uh, I think this is not very relevant to what I've been working on, so I'll, I'll probably skip it for now. Emmanuel? Okay, let, let, yeah. So let me let me just uh, take Emmanuel Goffey's position and, and try and uh, make it practical, okay? I'm here in Beijing, and what I see, um, you know, whenever I'm in and out of China, uh, and then I read the foreign newspapers and I read the Chinese newspapers as to what uh, some of the ethical issues in technology are. Uh, it's very interesting. Um, 
the issues that Facebook and Twitter and all of the social medias that were created in the 2000s, in 2007 or so, um, in my view, and I see it very uh, graphically, um, have a different set of AI issues than uh, the platforms that were created in the 2010s. Uh, and the platforms that were created in the 2007, they were, they were desktop-based platforms. Uh, you know, and the focus there uh, was on generating uh, lots of users, uh, you know, creating user-generated content and so on. Um, and uh, it, the whole idea was to create addiction uh, you know, to platforms and so on. Um, by the time you reach 2010, uh, in China, for example, you have uh, uh, WeChat and Alipay and Ali, Alibaba and so on. Um, um, all of these had their iterations in the 2000s. I, I, at the same time as the Western social media was starting, they basically copied them and, and they tried to uh, replicate that in China. Uh, but on the desktop model, it never worked. It didn't work very well. Um, and, but when it went on to mobile, uh, it then created a whole different ecosystem that today I see a, a, a fundamental difference in the challenges of AI being applied uh, to social media, Western social media, and AI being applied to what I would call mobile-based social media. Um, you know, um, the, the, the Western-based social media, very, um, you know, subscription-centric, very, um, you know, publishing-centric, very content-centric, uh, whereas the mobile-based um, um, platforms uh, have community creation ecosystem type uh, issues, uh, which have more to do with, um, you know, privacy issues and so on, uh, as opposed to, uh, you know, uh, siloing uh, the users into, uh, into habits, into, um, into addiction and so on. Um, and I, uh, because I, you know, cover financial services more than any other industry, um, what I see uh, is going to happen uh, is that another iteration of uh, AI is going to come about, which is a high degree of personalization. Um, and if today, I mean, in the last 10 years uh, in China, everyone is very proud of, um, you know, um, uh, WeChat and what an amazing uh, impact it's had on lifestyles in, in China. Um, and that's mobile centric. Now, when you get into a world that is device independent, uh, you're going to start seeing a whole new set of ethical issues uh, coming about. So, for example, uh, on the mobile device uh, for, you know, for GPS, for example, you actually still, um, you know, you, 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 you onboard into an, a GPS app and the GPS app then collects all of the data and then makes that available to you, telling you where you are. But in a mobile, in a device independent uh, platform, your, your device might well be the you know, the collector of data that tells you where you are. In other words, you don't need to, um, you know, then go on to another, um, a, a, another device or another platform or, a, or an application to, to discover where you are. Now, that then creates personalized, personalized um, issues in ethics. You know, uh, what data is personal to me that I have the right not to share to people and so on. So this is my contribution to what Emmanuel, Emmanuel just said. Uh, you know, a practical um, evolution as I see uh, having taken place over time. Yeah, and then if, if, if I if I may add something is, it's not only about and you're perfectly right about that. It's it's really case by case uh, situation that you have to study, and you're perfectly right about that. But I just want to jump uh, onto the fact that it's also a culture, cultural you know uh, a point of view that you have to take into account. Of working with Huawei, as I was saying. So the mindset in China, for example, regarding privacy is not the mindset that we have in the West, in France, in the US, etc. Right. So you also have to take that into account when you're doing ethics, you have to uh, and that, that's really difficult. I know that you have to withdraw from your own, you know, a priori Westerners, a priori about what is acceptable, what is not, what is good, what is bad, etc., etc., just to adjust. And that's the difficulty with, with ethics is that it's it must be really flexible. Uh, so far, what I've seen is much more kind of a tendency to try to impose some Western uh, standards based on Western issues and Western concern to the rest of the world. And, and this is something that I feel we, we think we, we should think about. Definitely, uh, uh, Confucian uh, thinking is not, you know, Christian thinking, which is not the same as Ubuntu thinking, because we're talking about that uh, Shinto thinking. And, and, uh, and for those who are working with the IEEE, uh, they've clearly stated that 
this kind of philosophy, this kind of wisdoms or spiritualities must be brought into the debate just to enrich it and to avoid having this kind of unique and one-fit-all solution to really complex and diverse uh, uh, issues or cases that you were mentioning, Emmanuel. Good point. I, I take that in. And in fact, I see that. In fact, uh, what you just said about uh, the values being different uh, explains very quickly, very clearly why certain um, you know, community-based applications were very successful in China uh, and may not have ever gotten off the ground uh, in the US or in Europe. Um, but what's interesting is um, what I see here in China, even among my own employees, uh, is that uh, there's a greater sense of self-awareness and there's a greater sense of personal um, assets, uh, you know, what's mine and, and uh, um, you know, what's valuable to me. Uh, and I think that's a globe. That is a global phenomenon, and and it's evolving. And I see uh, Chinese young people being very mindful, uh, increasingly mindful uh, of what they consider to be personal assets. And I think that AI as a technology, and here, Emmanuel, you might you might uh, give me a dimension on this, um, is actually heading towards uh, increased personal enrichment. At the same time, it's uh, it's uh, it's actually uh, you know taking away personal um, you know uh, um, uh, rights uh, in a way uh, you know uh, uh, the the technology is taking us that way. It's it's giving us rights and it's taking away rights from us uh, at the personal level. Uh, and I think that that uh, dimension uh, is something that all of us suffer uh, regardless of where we we come from. So we probably need to identify. The, the elements that are that are universal, uh, you know, we, we come back again to the philosophical question of universality. What what is universal? Personal rights is that universal? Um, you know, uh, uh, privacy is that universal? Uh, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. So you know, th those are some of the issues. I want to get a bit more concrete here. I really like the example of the mobile applications because, for example, the main metrics that developers of the applications or the, even the platforms, they develop basically lifetime value, the much the time you spend on your phone, basically adapt the algorithms. So you scroll things, you see things that you might stuck on for the long time. And basically that's the metrics they optimize because they because of different business models. And this is something that is kind of really clear and transparent for the management. Okay, these are metrics, we need to maximize that. But uh, we are growing, the companies are evolving, the, we are evolving, so we get into the more values. As you said, we want to understand what is ours personal and our time is actually really precious. So talking about the time, I like how Apple, for example, there is a new feature. Now I can manage basically the time and see clearly how much I spend on my phone. And actually I might aim to reduce it. I might put some things that to stop me when I'm spending too much time. And from the metrics of the kind of engagement point of view, it's negative. It might maybe ruin some profits or something like this. But on the other side, it's good from the ethical and moral point of view, and even philosophical human values point of view. Could you guys give some advices to the managers how they can keep the profits growing? So basically some financial metrics to, to attain, but at the same time to move also from kind of the value pyramid and allow to the people, to the company, to the community, kind of apart from the economical growth, some personal and humanitarian growth as well. What they need to track, if we can track something from this point of view. Um, uh, Alex is uh, also something which I probably wanted to add. I think this is before you mentioned the question. So um, I, I was hearing like uh, Emmanuel, um, like both Emmanuels talking about, you know, like having that um, ethical perspective to the applications that we are building. And I would probably say that, uh, you know, one of the points that Emmanuel, um, uh, Emmanuel Goff mentioned that, you know, we are trying to pull out the bias out of the system. And the reason behind that is that we do address that there exists those biases and it's not right to have those biases because that itself is pulling out the uh, the fundamental right of people to have equal equ equality in things like having that equal equal rights having that equal say in in situations and having um, equal access to uh, like products and services if i may say so that's where like companies are driving a lot and focusing a lot towards building trustworthy AI systems. Some of them call it as responsible AI systems or ethical AI systems. And this is not as simple as just having, you know, like the ethics part in, in mind. And I'm coming from a technical background and I have been helping in building these AI systems uh, from a product standpoint. So I can say that uh, when we are building these systems, 
right from uh, like a smaller application or it could be something which is integrated in an organizational flow or it could be something which is you know a, a business to customer or a business to business uh, service so in all these situations we are looking at five different pillars and these five pillars pretty much encompass things uh, that we were discussing as one of the one of the concerns so it does encompass having like fairness and uh, debias debiasing in the model and that is because we want to see that you know uh, having the fundamental human right of equal opportunity so for example in one of the use cases uh, in the past i think uh, a year or two ago apple had um, had released their cards and in their application system itself uh, a male and a female having pretty much the same credentials uh, the female was being rejected for the card versus the male was not and the only the only change or like the only difference in parameter between both these people was just just the gender and that is where we see the human biases reflecting back in these models because these models are trained on data which comes from a real life real world use case and i feel with time these technology are helping us understand what are some of the fundamental humanitarian problems in the society and how can we see them through a data perspective how can we see them from an evidence perspective and how can we work on it to rectify it so now that we have this you know data in front of us which is giving us um, giving us a heads up that hey this is what is happening in the society and this is what we are moving towards then we can take those uh, remedial steps to understand and how we, how we can rectify such things happening in the society the second thing the second pillar uh, after fairness would be robustness and this is connecting to what uh, emmanuel daniel was saying that every country has different sets of rules different sets of priorities different ways of how technology is handled uh, different demographics and various different factors and this is where we want the models to be robust and adjust towards different uh, schemas in the society this being attached with the third pillar of privacy because when we are developing these models or like these ai systems they are being built on top of different regulations coming from from different countries like some of you are from europe so you might be knowing about the eu that was uh, that is being worked on so things like gdpr things like eu things like california uh, policy Pro protection act etc so all these are various steps which are taken Uh, which are being like initiated by different countries or different states for that matter to protect the data to protect the rights of their citizens right and this is where we see a difference in the in the regular uh, in the governmental uh, procedures for example some of the countries have data localization embedded in their in their system that itself poses a challenge for companies to pull out the data from all their users who might not be in their same base country in that situation federated learning plays a huge role because we are trying to say that now we are decentralizing uh, the data the data is still going to be decentralized while we are, tr are training the models on a central server so things like that are being addressed and um, another point which i was uh, i was interested to mention is explainability so alex you were just mentioning something about your phone right like you have these apps which are able to give you heads up on that like, hey you're spending this much time in your uh, in in your mobile device and how you can you know work on that so things like those are part of explainable ai systems where we are trying to say that um, for example in an insurance use case if you're trying to reject somebody's policy in current situation if your policy gets rejected or you're being quoted a certain rate you have no idea why that's happening but imagine a world where we are able to attach explainability to all our models and we say that hey uh, because of your certain activities these are probably your historical activities because of which uh, your score was affected in a certain way and your premium has been increased or decreased so attaching that explainable part into the ai models help us help people uh, trust more on the ai systems what was previously not there like people used to consider ai systems as a black box people used to say that hey like there is some models running behind the scenes and i have no idea what's what's happening and how do i trust these uh, these systems when i do not know how these systems are interpreting my data and how are they pushing the results back to me so that's what is uh, addressed in the explainable ai part and the final pillar is transparency 
So the fifth pillar and the final pillar is transparency. This is where we say that, uh, you know, we are pulling out every information uh, about the model, about the services that we are building. And we are telling the users that your data has been, has, is being used in these different scenarios. For example, currently, if I use my phone, I have no idea um, if uh, the alarms that I'm setting up, is that data being used somewhere? Is uh, If I'm typing something on my keyboards, is that data being tracked somewhere? Where is this data being sent to and how is it being used? That is something none of us probably know at, at current situation, where we know that there is some trackers which are sitting in our phones or our computers, but we don't know what data is being collected. We don't know where is it being used and how is it? how are the recommendations of these models being sent back to us? That's where the transparency part fits in. And I, I promise that a lot of companies are actively working on all these five pillars. And this is something, um, you know, as AI is, a, I would still call it a pretty noise field because from theoretical AI getting into something which is practical and affecting so many, uh, so many individuals, it's something which is probably happening in the last decade. And we are still learning the effects of it. And this is probably one of the better uh, frameworks that I've seen with respect to like trustworthy AI that we are addressing all these five pillars and making them uh, more viable for users to like, uh, uh, I would say like utilize the, utilize the power of AI. Yeah, Ashwarya, thank you very much. It was really great, uh, like overview of like, actually applied problems, basically what is actually happening, what we actually need to implement kind of from the details point of view. Emmanuel, Daniel, from the in the financial industry, for example, all these problems like explainability and fairness, uh, how, do, how do you see them in your experience? What do you see like maybe the cases that actually happen the most often and they're the most painful? Uh, let me tell you this, uh, um, in financial services, the business that I'm in is to assess banks uh, in all the regions that in which we operate. So we actually collect data on, um, on, uh, on, on AI projects that all banks um, um, uh, you know, uh, perform. Um, and let me tell you that um, I've just gone through the list of um, a number of the leading initiatives, um, you know, chatbot, uh, robo-advisors, um, you know, um, for tra transaction banking, fraud, um, you know, um, uh, fraud and so on. Uh, banking or financial services right now, whether in Asia or anywhere in the world, uh, is still uh, very inward looking. Uh, the AI is not being deployed for the customer as yet, even though it's being sold as uh, being for the customer. And the mindset of financial services, the industry today, uh, is still stuck in the um, you know, industrial era. Uh, so when they use AI, it's mostly, now I've just mentioned to you, uh, you know, chatbots, uh, uh, robo-advisors and so on. Uh, it looks like a customer enhancing experience. Actually at the back end, it's a cost saving, um, um, you know, platform. Uh, you know, with a chatbot, you don't need to have a call center. With, with uh, you know, with robo-advisors, um, you know, you, you need to reduce the expense that you have on wealth managers. Uh, and you even create the bias uh, into your robo-advisors. Um, so the thing is that financial services is really a, a follower rather than a leader. Uh, but the agenda is being uh, imposed on them. So when we think about tokens today, for example, or cryptocurrencies and so on, um, you know, whether or not whichever side of the aisle you are on, uh, it's now creating a new level of personalization. Uh, and, and actually the AI can uh, even sit on the token, uh, you know, uh, and, and carry a lot more intelligence uh, than it is right now. And a lot of work being done on that front, uh, blockchain and, and all that. Um, I was actually curious with Aishwari's uh, comment just now on accountability. Um, and I wanted to ask, because this is an area where I don't have a sense, but um, open AI, for example, uh, you know, as a platform for greater transparency and, and accountability and self-checking mechanism within the industry. Um, I, when I saw what happening, what happened in, uh, you know, in open source technology, IBM bought one and uh, Microsoft bought another uh, open source platform, uh, they were intended to be uh, vendor neutral, uh, you know, and open, uh, you know, to, to all of the world. It, it's not, it was never meant to be industrialized or uh, owned by a corporation as it were. Uh, the interesting thing about 
ethics in AI, um, you know, if it, if, um, if say, for example, open AI is a, a source of ethics, um, compliance and ethics, um, you know, self-checking mechanism, um, what prevents that from being corporatized? Because um, when, when, when any element of, uh, uh, of uh, integrity uh, is corporatized, then it becomes, uh, you know, compromised in, in a sense. So I, I was curious when, when she was making those comments, um, you know, um, uh, whether any of you have an opinion on open AI and whether that helps to ameliorate, um, you know, accountability in AI. I think the channel, I feel um, with OpenAI is with just with the open source community, like I've personally worked with two of the open source communities. And one of the reasons which where I really love this open source community concept is the push towards research. And that's probably one of the missing pieces when it comes to corporate world, because mostly in corporate settings, you are uh, you are driven towards a business value. You're you're driven towards producing numbers. And that, that's how businesses work, right? So that's probably one of the biggest focuses for every business. Whereas in, in a community where we are trying to build technology, open source is something that pushes more towards research. And that's what pushes companies to work towards a, a similar goal. So things like when, when we're talking about communities like OpenAI, they are setting up these standards, which uh, I wouldn't say should be, but they are being followed by various different companies to maintain their standpoint on such kind of technology and research going behind it. Thank you. Yeah. It's very interesting because actually also I know that the AI is actually growing so fast because of this open culture, because this is almost only a scientific and field where actually so many things have been open, so actually we can reuse them, we can use them freely to build applications, to try it out in the real world to check actually if the authors did the research well. Like there were cases that they were published some research and the next day the guys were like, I tried this code, the guys have the mistake, the guys could improve it the next day. And that's where the field is developing uh, so rapidly. Actually, what's interesting that uh, it, I think also one of the reasons that investors, they actually start having a look at the open source side. There's a recent case of the Hugging Face library, which started as an open source project they developed in the tools for NLP. And now basically they're startup with uh, investments and uh, what do you guys think? Uh, what should, the, should is, is like the future of the business models for the open source? Should everyone kind of start the open source project with having already some commercialization in mind, or is it better to leave as the arts and the community thing? I can add something here. Um, so the reality is, most of these open source uh, projects are being backed by either corporates or they're using this as a um, mechanism to get some sort of more visibility or drive uh, some um, some customers. And that's uh, th that's what we are seeing here. Um, a lot of these uh, um, open source projects that have been open sourced by Microsoft, Facebook, or um, OpenAI, um, they um, they're being used to actually um, deliver a lot of visibility and credibility for the company at the same time. And uh, on the other hand, many individuals are actually entering these open source communities and then leveraging the open source to have a backend kind of uh, a business project that will run on this um, uh, you know, uh, library or platform and um, become corporate rise. So, so that's the, what, what is the kind of trend that we're seeing. Um, that doesn't mean it's a bad thing necessarily. It's like the world uh, runs on numbers and, and uh, everything needs to, needs to be some sort of, um, have some incentive and that's the reality. Like um, you, you can't just uh, run and um, uh, run an organization or community by itself without having any sort of incentive. Uh, but it's it's a still it's a great way to um, um, I guess bring the value back to the community, get them involved, um, let the research going on and and instead of having the closed kind of source environment, which we it used to be the time that I was um, um, software engineer, um, Microsoft was leading that kind of kind of environment and everybody kind of uh, were, um, you know, kind of competing against 
such a um, you know closed environment that um, keeping everything IP and and making sure everything is um, only available um, um, from from the company. I think it can be changed if, uh, but this is again my biased opinion that if uh, the actual communities they should start start this project so having some product thinking in mind. So basically, when you start a research, it's nice because it kind of allows you to be like free. You have no boundaries. But if you have at least some targets, maybe like okay, I do the research. Maybe I don't know where it leads, but I want to have a lot of community around this research. So at least it already can have some at least potential commercial interest and actually it can protect you from other competitors or maybe you can think starting about okay this is the research but they're targeting some important problem i don't know if i'm going to solve it but maybe this problem has some metrics so you think with this uh, in mind i think it could be a solution what uh, what anyone thinks alex one of the things which i feel is some of the biggest technologies which we have which we see currently have started as not a business value generating scheme so, um, for example, like sometimes I do wonder, like uh, I, I read a lot about like Google's research and they have like an entire team, which is uh, like each year they have been funded a lot of uh, like millions and millions of dollars in doing research, which doesn't directly contribute to a business value. But, you know, the kind of research that they do is pushing, um, pushing us towards a time where every company or like everybody um, who is, you know, like developing and working on these technologies have a vision that what is possible. For example, one of the projects which uh, which I, I keep following is Project Loon. And that is something which uh, has not really, you know, driven a business or has not, is not uh, generating that sales number for them. But that is something which is pushing us to, uh, pushing us towards thinking that, hey, like, do we have the internet accessibilities in all these places? And if not, then what are the possible ways to help these people who are living or the communities living in these locations where internet access is not available? And imagine one day without internet. Like for us, even a day without internet seems scary. So if you if you think about people who are living in these areas who have no access to internet, they might be missing on a lot of a uh, lot of information. And that's why we try to produce that, hey, like these kind of works, which are probably towards a cause, probably towards some social good and not directly be working on numbers are also very important. So that's where I feel like having this, you know, like this ideology of, um, okay, I'm building something for a greater good is good because it's, it's somewhere pushing boundaries and like what is possible and what's not. It's an interesting thing because uh, here we're coming to the question when we kind of like, it's also in the concept of OKR, objective key results. There's a great objective, which is basically can be, can sound as a, as an idea, as you say, it's like we're going to some direction. And of course you, it's hard to describe this direction with the numbers, but then you need to ensure that you go in the right direction. So for example, when you say, I want to access this technology open source in the regions where there is no, in, how do you measure it? And basically, this is what I'm kind of trying to push our consensus to the thing. There are a lot of good ideas, and we are all good in talking about the ideas. But when we start doing, when we work with our customers, we work with our partners, we start some activity, and then the week and the month, we need to say, okay, where we are. Are we going closer to the goal or not? So basically, with the open source, what, what could be measured? This I understand maybe not, it should be financial metrics, but at least we should know that every day, every week, every month, we're going in the right direction. And actually the same about the ethics, the same about the open source, basically the old questions we discussed today, it's like the right direction, but we need to be sure that we are going the right direction. So one is starting with the mission statement, right? For example, any open source community or like any open source project has a mission statement towards it. So this is what we are trying to solve. And for open source, one of the best ways to measure their impact is through community. Like how is it impacting the community? How many users do we have? How has it changed their uh, turnaround time? Uh, is, is my technology helping them do something faster? Is my technology helping them do something better? Or is it, uh, is it probably addressing a problem, uh, addressing a community which was not really in limelight earlier? So just help getting a feedback from the community is very important when it comes to like such open source projects. No one one aspect one question of uh, of ethics which which is uh, which is sort of coming out from this conversation is this who should fund uh, an ethics project uh, should it be private enterprise or should it be state now 
uh, you know, we are all in different continents right now, you know, the US, uh, Europe and China and, and Asia. And, and the philosophies are so different in each of these continents. That in the US, uh, a company like IBM uh, is able to fund uh, non-profit making projects for a long time, for 10 years, and then, uh, you know, burn rate and, and so on. It, they, they can absorb that. Um, in, in Europe, uh, you know, the state seems to be very involved, um, you know, subsidizing a lot of these programs. In China, the state becomes involved. Uh, it becomes a geopolitical issue, uh, you know, uh, so the state is not consciously or obviously involved, but um, you know, you, you, you have companies like Huawei uh, who are funding it, uh, who, who say that they're funding it uh, out of their own resources in that way. Um, you know, the, the thing is that um, the role of the state, the role of private enterprise and the role of the individual, um, you know, um, um, and each of these uh, are sort of trying to um, affect each other. You know, what's interesting in financial services is banks are, are really bad investors uh, in new technology and, and bad investors in the infrastructure for new technology, including uh, uh, ethics. Um, they, they usually buy it in after it's been created. Um, and uh, the one thing that makes banks very bad in fact, investors in ethics uh, is that uh, financial services itself is a regulated uh, industry. Uh, in other words, there's already a bias built in, a bias to uh, protect the continued survival of the industry. Uh, and, and so they, they, they are sort of users of um, AI rather than uh, builders of AI. Uh, you know, uh, and, and whatever technology you build outside of financial services, you've got to hand it over uh, because the regulators will make you hand it over and so on. Um, so, so what is a, um, you know, an acceptable neutral platform uh, that is fair, as you say, and and uh, um, you know, and and that is um, and also accountable, um, you know, to to the end user. So all of the infrastructure that uh, Ashwari mentioned just now, for example, um, explain, explain, explainability and so on, uh, all that is good intention. But if um, if it is in the hand of private enterprise, uh, it's done with profit uh, as the motive. If it's in the hand of state, uh, you know, there there are. Uh, you know, philosophical issues which are different from from a commercial and and, and you know issue and stuff like that. So, so I'm curious, you know, how that will evolve. Honestly, I would say that if I if I were to look at uh, at United States or like Western Western universe, it's uh, it's mostly driven by tech companies. It is driven a lot by tech companies. So, I feel like and and all these industries, for example, like companies like IBM, Google, Facebook, Netflix, everybody is playing their role in building systems which are more uh, robust or like building systems which are more trustworthy. So I, I do not really see a concern that, you know, companies are driven by business value, but also they want to build something which is a resilient uh, platform. Like they want the, it's not that they want their business goals in, just in short term, but they want it in longer term, right? And that's where it is also beneficial for them to attach all these components to those systems that they're building, which will help them stay stabilized in a longer period of time. Mm -hmm. if, if I may on, on that point is, uh, first, I don't think that it's really relevant to make a difference between states and private company. Uh, I feel like uh, most of the time they work end in end, definitely. And, and whatever it is private or public, they all have kind of certain benefits that they're looking for. Uh, it can be, uh, you know, uh, financial benefits, can be strategic uh, benefits uh, in terms of diplomacy. Uh, so, so whatever the actor, they will have something in mind. That's the big issue that we have in philosophy is that most of the time, all those principles that have been mentioned, explainability, transparency, et cetera, they are, they are presented as kind of deontological tools, meaning that they are principles that you cannot violate, right? Because they are fundamental for human beings, these kind of things. But on the other hand, what we see is that the reality behind that is that everything is really consequentialist. Uh, when you're talking about explainability, for example, or transparency in terms of AI, it's really nonsensical because transparency doesn't make sense if people that you are showing what is going on in the black box are not able to understand it. Most of the time I make this comparison with me when I go to the mechanics, right? You open the trunk, show me what is happening in the motor, explaining me everything. 
what I'm not able to understand. It is perfectly transparent, but that does not change anything because I'm unable to understand. So you can be really transparent. I've tried to go through this kind of algorithm. There is a, a French newspaper that has released these algorithms. And if you're not a tech guy, if you're not a computer scientist, you will not understand. They can be transparent that they want, it will not change anything. So all this kind of transparency, explainability is a way just to move the, the, uh, the responsibility, the accountability on the shoulder of the user saying, oh, you were aware of that, you knew it, we showed you what is, what is happening. So you cannot say that you were not aware of what was happening with your data. It's much more that than really a deontological point of view saying that people have to know because people cannot know if they're not able to understand. And myself, when I'm looking, for example, at the setting of the cookies when you go to a website, I cannot do that, so I just accept them. So if I do something wrong, what I would be told is, oh, you were aware, you had the choice, you could set your own cookies the way you wanted, but I'm unable to do that, right? So it's all about, once again, interest, vested interest, may be public or private, that does not change anything. The big issue that we have here is that most of the time, people, I mean, real people, those from the street, are not into the debate. They are not participating. They do not have any kind of say. You have people that are supposedly representing people, right? Like say France, you have the government and the authority. But when you look closer at, into that, you see like, for example, the French president has been elected by maybe 40, 50% of the population. So he's speaking for those 40, 50% of the population. What about the 40 and 50% that did not vote for him that does not agree with his point of view? And it can be, much harder in a dictatorship situation, tyrannical, you know, our country. So all this wording that has been created, once again, it's mainly cosmetic, it's narrative. It does not mean anything. Trustworthy AI, if you uh, if you followed what has, what has happened with the European Union regulation, this kind of thing, you've certainly read the, the paper by Thomas Metzinger, Professor Thomas Metzinger was uh, part of the panel of uh, high level experts uh, writing the guidelines for trustworthy. He left, because what he was saying is that at the very end, it's just a narrative. It's just a bedtime story as he wrote it, right? For, for consumers, just to create artificially kind of a trust, but AI itself cannot be trusted because it has no intention. It's not autonomous. You can trust people that are developing it. You can trust people that are using it, that are deploying it, but you cannot trust the system because trust is based on the probability that the other agent will you know, cheat on you or not. So if we consider that AI is not autonomous enough, that there is still human in control, we cannot talk about trustworthy AI. And it's a way just to move once again, the focus from the individual people that are behind those algorithms and those systems toward a technical tool, right? When I take the plane, I don't wonder if I can trust the plane. I can maybe the builder, the company that has built the train or the, the, the plane or the people that are using it, but I cannot trust the plane for itself. All this wording, and that's really philosophical, must be questioned because we all take it for granted. All the time I hear exactly the same wording with the same argument, with the same principles, but with no in-depth you know, uh, analysis or just thinking, oh, what does that mean, trustworthy AI? Does even mean something. Trust for CAI doesn't mean anything because AI does not exist because artificial does not mean anything because intelligence is impossible to define. So how can something that you cannot define be real, right? So this is the kind of question with all this wording that we really have to, uh, at some point, I, I don't know what, what is the reality behind that, but I'm, I'm just wondering why we are not asking this kind of question. And I feel like it's not only a matter of public The people that are involved into that uh, because it's not enough to say oh you were aware of the rules you were aware that you could set your own cookies you were aware because that was transparent that was explainable and all that stuff because most of the people myself included we are just scrolling without even thinking about it we are just accepting all the cookies because we don't have time to go into that to set all the cookies for each website that we will consult right so this is mainly cosmetics, it's just a veal, right? So even if the intentions are good sometimes, it doesn't lead to anything good at the very end. Anna, and in your practice, how do you, how do you address these problems? Yeah. How do you dive deeper? 
to fix it. Yeah, I want I wanted to um, also comment on that uh, just very shortly. So uh, first of all, to to your uh, first question, how how the companies how do we com incentivize companies to actually take responsible stance of AI, and also whether we are getting closer to the goal. And I think um, I, I always separate the problems, technical AI problems and ethical AI problems. And I think it's pretty hard to determine to understand whether we we have goals at, at all so far. Um, and then to ask the question whether we are closer to the goal. Because to have goals, it's uh, for us something to know. Um, we want fair AI solution, non-discriminatory and so on, but we don't really know what fairness, whose fairness, who's non for whom non-discrimination, what kind of transparency, what uh, Emmanuel has been already discussing. So it's like, first of all, we are pretty um, blurry about what, what our goals, and uh, then it's hard to determine whether we are close to it. And then, um, so the hardest part for me, um, and what I've seen, again, to be the gap in, in the discussions was, how do we really incentivize companies to, to take the responsible stance to what we call now responsible AI? And like recently I started writing the blogs and what took me the, the longest time to write the blog was exactly about the AI and responsibility. Because um, my major question was that, uh, what are the even financial benefits for the companies beyond some uh, looking at corporate beyond looking at corporate social responsibility. Usually, companies look at AI ethics, something bonus, something ethical, something additional to their uh, tech, technology solution. It's something under their uh, CSR goal, just to um, write down something on a website for the public eye to to look at, like some framework or or the blog. So um, my major question was like, how do you convince companies that the AI comprehensive AI governance framework is needed, the AI strategy is needed and AI ethical principles in practice is needed. So, uh, and, and the, so far two answers that I have found and I'm communicating to the companies usually is like, first, uh, first thing is that usually if there is a clash, the companies do not always get away. This, this is not the very best word, but they do not always get away with it. Because uh, if there is a risk, sometimes they have to uh, take responsibility. I bring the example of the A-level algorithm that if you have heard of, UK, uh, that happened in UK. So it had, it had very tremendous um, outcomes. The first, first was about the um, reputation of the company, um, of the company, of the government. That people lost trust uh, both in uh, because it, it was a collaboration of specific company and the government. That people lost trust in the government uh, solution and in, in the company. Then finally, it, the solution and the problem has affected thousands of students. And uh, the final outcome was that the manager of the project has resigned. So there was the accountability issue. And then the problem that emerged was that most of the times the problem was incompetence. Uh, of, of the company of the solution. And there, there was also the um, inaccountability and irresponsibility in place. So this, the comp uh, this is the um, situations where companies really have problems in terms of reputation. This is one thing. But another thing is that um, there is the real benefit to really take care of the responsibility, the responsible AI approach. And I think HRA has also mentioned it, that Netflix or these companies are already starting to take care of some uh, ethical problems because they see uh, long-term sustainable um, benefits to that, not only financial benefits, but also uh, the public trust benefit, um, the governmental trust, regulator, policymaker trust, and then um, Recently, probably some bigger companies are seeing the benefits of AI governance frameworks, uh, but mostly you, you still have to convince them. Another thing is that um, as long as the awareness of the people is increasing, like the users and users, um, sometimes I'm just observing the comments on Facebook, on Twitter, on LinkedIn to see what people are thinking. And I, I definitely see that the people are already well aware of that there is the use of algorithms, if there is the social bots, for example, used um, and if there's some trolling or <laughs> some um, like non-real people uh, taking the place and take the conversation. So the awareness of the people, the people are really paying attention to uh, the property of the things. People are making decisions uh, before before using the specific product of, of, of the company, as long as there are no there is no money money policy. Um, 
space on the market that the users will choose another product if they don't see the value um, and purpose of, of, of the product. And not only users, also employ, employers are also choosing the companies based on their values and if, if it fits to, to their own purpose and values. So it's kind of scrutiny from all the sides, policymakers, users, and employers, and it's about raising Awareness and being sometimes also nice. Uh, not if you want to really uh, look at responsible development of uh, of AI, uh, it's like kind of um, pressure from um, maybe like corporate world does not like it at some point, but uh, there is kind of pressure from all, all all parts. And if they really want to take, if they really want to benefit from all sides of technology, then they also need to take um, care of ethical development and what we call responsible AI. I see that in our conversation, we literally are kind of trying to balance between two things. One is that the wealth creation, economics, and uh, all the related to this. And then after the wealth is created, they need to create some value, like maybe human value. And that's hard to do this. And uh, as you get to you try to balance between philosophy and actions, wealth and ethics. And uh, to kind of wrap it up a bit, I want to ask every one of you to give two advices, maybe two books, two blogs, two videos one on the kind of philosophical philosophy topic ethical topic basically where to go another one what to do what can be the next step for this maybe it can be advice can be a book can be a blog youtube whatever you guys think but just to so our listeners they go to the first source and they get motivated they get a direction and then they go to the second source and they start doing and this can be the immediate value of the discussed. One of the books that I've read uh, and was very interesting to me and which talks not about just the technical part of AI is Life 3.0. So that's that's one of the very like interesting books. Yeah, I, I, I don't have any kind of um, advice because that would be biased advice, right? And, and the problem is that I could, I could only give advices regarding books that I've read, but I know that I've read a really small amount of them. And I think that there are thousands of really interesting books that are outside that I won't, or that I won't be able to read because they're written in, uh, in foreign languages. Uh, so I, my, I, I would, my advice would be just be curious, make your own opinion, build your own opinion. Just don't buy things that you find here and there. And sometimes try to uh, look at uh, outside the box thinking instead of reading resumes of uh, summaries of summaries that are made on other summaries, right? Just try to make your own opinion. Just go, uh, uh, in terms of philosophy, uh, go back to, to the uh, uh, to, to, to philosophers instead of reading analysis of philosophers, right? Uh, uh, that, that's great to have people that are interpreting, but it's also great to build your own opinion. So just, just be curious, read whatever you want, but read a lot and read diversity. I like this one. That's, uh, that's a very good one. <laughs> uh, for me, I would say I would go with a book. I, I know that I haven't read a lot of them, but um, one of them I really liked was um, The AI Superpowers by um, Kai Fu Li. Um, and I guess it would give us a little bit more understanding of what's happening in the war and what to expect. Um, one thing that I'm um, very worried about is uh, the um, superpowers, especially using AI in, in uh, some sense that uh, might be um, used in a competitive way, or um, I would say even uh, bolder than that, being weaponized. And that's something that we need to be very, very aware of. And uh, people need to be very conscious, ask the questions following Emmanuel's um, um, advice, always uh, think outside the box, uh, and make sure that uh, uh, don't take anything for granted. Things uh, will, will change quickly and will affect everybody's life. Lives. AI is uh, uh, is a super tool. It's not something to um, uh, that even if by this um, uh, current, I guess, definition, whatever we call AI, machine learning, or whatever it is, um, this is very powerful and um, will have a huge impact if it goes wrong it will hugely go wrong. You know, I, I've uh, I read uh, Kai-Fu Lee's book, uh, AI, um, China, China and all that. The, the interesting thing is that uh, all the books that are very popular on AI at the moment uh, 
has to do, except for Kai Fu Lee's book, right, uh, has to do with, oh, AI is going to change our lives. You know, we, we, uh, we, we shouldn't be afraid. Um, you know, it's not going to take away our jobs and, 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 and stuff like that. And how do we deal with AI, you know, um, um, and, and how do we make uh, use of uh, algorithms and so on? I'm also familiar with the Life 3.0 book, right? Uh, Being Human uh, in the Age of AI. Um, so, so many of these books are, are, are designed to help us, um, help us um, imagine uh, what's going to happen to us as a result of AI. You know, what's going to happen to my job, my lifestyle, uh, Am I going to be, you know, fooled by an algorithm? Uh, you know that sort of thing. And the thing about Kai Fu Lee's book is that there's only one or two chapters in there on AI. The rest of it is the history of, uh, you know, fintech and 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 uh, platforms in China. Um, so so the thing is that uh, the book that I haven't read um, is a book that what does AI make corporations into? Um, if you look at what platforms made corporations into, if you look at what platforms did to Facebook and Twitter and so on, it's that it's turned them into governments, you know? And what are governments asking them to do? They're, they're asking them to moderate uh, society, um, you know? And, and governments are sort of outsourcing that responsibility to these platforms because they are all encompassing, they are all powerful, right? And uh, when AI becomes increasingly institutionalized, uh, the question is, um, you know, what is the role of um, uh, business, of industry, um, you know, and, and, uh, and who is government uh, in, in, that, in, in that realm, right? So, yes, you can be self-administering, um, you can be, you know, self-regulating. Um, the, 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 the realm of self-regulation has passed now. Uh, you know, anything that's new uh, that is... Uh, all encompassing uh, needs an external regulator. So that's a that's a conversation uh, that that is that's a separate conversation on the on the evolution of regulation in finance today, for example. Um, I think if we if we restate what is the end goal that we are trying to achieve in ethics, and then work backwards uh, to understand uh, what kind of books need to be written in the first place. Um, the, the primers as to what AI is going to do to our lives, to, to our jobs, uh, that's past. Uh, we're now entering a realm where what AI is potentially going to do to society as a whole. And that's the, that's the final goal, the, 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 the top price uh, in AI ethics. Uh, what is the uh, ultimate destruction capable uh, when, when AI ethics breaks down? And, and actually, in the platform era, we've already seen what's already happening, which is there's great confusion in governance, um, you know, and, and AI is going to accentuate that. Uh, and it's going to create new players. Uh, many governments miss the opportunity to govern the platform era as it was evolving. Uh, and from that, we've learned a lot that we now need to figure out uh, what governance should look like um, as AI becomes more institutionalized and, you know, as new sets of corporations uh, take over, um, you know, the, the running of AI, um, you know, as a business, or as a platform. Um, I mean, that, that would, and that's the kind of book I'm looking for. Um, you know, I've, I've browsed through, I, I must say that I've sort of read a couple of the books, but, and I browsed, and I'm not excited about books that tell me that I'm going to lose my job tomorrow. Uh, there was one book that I read that had said that, yeah. Thanks everyone. Maybe more, more advices? Like for me, um, I would also go for, not go for the specific book. And uh, that usually what I'm, what I'm uh, saying, you might taking that approach myself. Like if you're on the technical side, if you're an ML developer, uh, it would make sense to also look at some philosophical writings and some ethical uh, ethics um, writings and social science, political science, and so on to uh, to get better awareness about the topics. And if you're on the other side, like policymaker or ethicist, and um, like working on governance and so on, it will make sense to uh, start some uh, learning some Python and data science courses, probably online courses, or um, also like neuroscience uh, would be uh, amazing. Like in my case, it was also I never before getting to AI field, I never wrote any line of code, but code. But when I got into it, I want to get better awareness of what's going on there technically, rather than just looking from ethical side and then 
I started to learn some um, coding in Python and so on. So uh, it's like um, this is this is the area of your unit really the cross disciplinary approach and everyone should kind of take their responsibility to um, look at other sides of uh, of their um, approaches. I think can also maybe add one book from my side. It's called Prediction Machines, The Simple Economics of AI by AJ Argival and the others. I think this can be potentially a nice bridge between people who ideate the ideas, who define the direction, and the engineers and researchers, because there should be glue between them. So there is a direction that people who are going to basically build about this direction, and there should be a communication bridge. And uh, hopefully this book can help you to or it can actually help to managers actually between this big people who create ideas and the engineers to translate the ideas to the actual plans that has to be executed. So this one recommendation from my side. And I think on this uh, nice note, when we have ideas, we have plans, we can wrap it up and uh, keep working on making AI useful, ethical, and potentially open out to us good, nice horizons of potential as a, as a human species not just as uh, cultures or people in individuals or countries. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye.